Welcome back. So we're going to talk about the atom, the quantum atom. And in fact, we'll review some of the history of, of the atom as we go along. But first, let's catch up from last time a little bit. I would like you to go on YouTube, type in tunneling Kotoriansky, just the way it's spelled there, and watch that. Uh, it's a very cool animation of what happens when a quantum particle tunnels. OK, here's a little quiz. How do you spot the difference between high kinetic energy wave functions and low kinetic energy wave functions? Let you think about that for a little bit. Oh, we could maybe use some light. Okay. Answer is, it's the wiggles. The more wiggles, the more kinetic energy. And we talked about that last time. Uh, I found this on the internet. A reporter wrote, the muons have a half-life of 2.2 microseconds. At the speed of light, this would give a range of only 660 meters. However, at relativistic speeds, the lifetime of the muon as we measure it is much longer. The author of this little uh, passage has the muon going at the speed of light. Why do you think that is? I'll let you look at those choices. Answer is, well, he's using an approximation. He's just kind of playing a little fast and loose. If the muon is going 99.9% .9 of the speed of light, it will go 660 meters, just about the same as if it were going at the speed of light. So it really doesn't matter. But I didn't lie to you. The particle can't go at the speed of light or faster. OK, there are student ratings available online you've probably gotten a notice about this from byu you have from from um now as i'm recording this until midnight april 16th which is exam prep day uh please do the survey uh, it helps the department um see what we should do in our courses different so we can make them better <clears throat> okay i know that my please is not that powerful so um we're going to do this. Everyone who completes the survey will have their final exam score raised by one correct answer out of the 42 that are on there. This is a little more than 2%. Uh, it's worth it. I won't be able to see what you wrote. I can only see that you filled out the survey, but I will know whether you did or not. And anybody who did will get an extra point on the final, even if that makes your score be more than 100%. You get the extra point no matter what. So if you want 102.35 or whatever percent, um, fill out the survey and then get a perfect score on the final. Here's another YouTube uh, viewing assignment. Go to YouTube, type in Schrodinger Animations Paul G, just the way I put it up here on the slide. And you'll find some Schrodinger animations. Look down a little bit, maybe. Um, everybody's comes up different. Look for one where in the YouTube frame it has a 12. Next to that, click on View Full Playlist and you can see 12 Schrodinger animations. In these animations, they uh, almost all begin with what looks like a hill. It's an animation of a hill. That hill is psi squared uh, for a two-dimensional particle. And you'll watch that hill interact with obstacles, including double slits and other particles. And it'll give you a little feel for what actually happens in the quantum world. These are exact calculations uh, in two dimensions of what would happen if particles hit obstacles and each other. One of the things you'll notice is that it starts off looking like a hill, but when it hits something, it breaks up into waves. That's because it had waves in it to start with. What, what you're seeing with the hill, when, when you do psi squared on a wave packet hill, you don't see the wiggles, you just see the outer envelope of the wave packet. But when it interacts with something, it interferes with itself or with parts of itself or however you want to think about that. And you get uh, these wiggly patterns. This is what we think actually happens in the subatomic world, weird as it is. Okay, so I'm going to give you a brief history of the atom. This history starts in 450 BC with a Greek philosopher named Democritus. This is his entire history, entire theory of the atom, right here. One, all matter consists of invisible particles called atoms. 
Hey, that's pretty good. Two, atoms are indestructible. Well, okay, so we didn't get that one right. Uh, three, atoms are solid but invisible. Um, a little iffy. Uh, they're kind of solid. Atoms are homogeneous. That means it's a lump of stuff and the, the stuff is all the same from the outside to the inside and everywhere inside the atom, it's all the same. Okay, you didn't get that one right. And atoms differ in size, shape, mass, position, and arrangement. That's actually uh, pretty accurate, as we'll see in a little bit. Okay, 450 BC, uh, atoms are talked about, and all matter is made of these little tiny things, according to Democritus. 2100 years later, uh, there wasn't much else to say about it other than those, those things for 2000 years because we didn't know how to do science really. But in the 1600s, Isaac Newton uh, found that he could describe how the gas laws worked by um, thinking about little atoms, little particles bouncing around inside a box and interpreting pressure as the momentum change of the particles as they whack on the walls. And that's what we studied in chapter 21. In the early 1800s, atoms got a little structure. They were visualized as a little lump of stuff with hooks on them. That made them good for explaining chemical reactions like why oxygen binds to two hydrogens, why nitrogen binds to three hydrogens, etc. <clears throat> and then in 1897, J.J. Thompson discovered that atoms had electrons in them. There was a particle that you could rip out of the atom. And so we knew that the atom was not a homogeneous lump. It had parts and we could see one of those parts and J.J. Thompson called it an electron. Uh, he found that it had negative charge and when you ripped one out of an atom, the part that was left behind had positive charge. And so there had to be positively charged particles in the atom as well. And now the race was on to see what atoms were actually made of. In 1904, after thinking carefully about his experience, experiments and about the laws of physics as he understood them at that time, Thomson proposed the following model for an atom. He said, these electrons I found, they are continuously distributed. Uh, well, not continuously, little lumps. They're like raisins in a cake or in a pudding. And you could rip them, rip one out. The pudding that they live in is positively charged. And his picture was that that was just a uniformly charged blob of stuff, but it had the same amount of positive charge as there were electrons inside. So that when you ripped one out, you'd have more positive charge than negative charge and what was left behind was positive. So that was the plum pudding model and that lasted for about seven years. In 1911, Ernest Rutherford, uh, who worked with radioact radioactive uh, nuclei, didn't know they were nuclei yet, but he worked with radioactivity and he knew that there were these fast particles that came out called alpha particles. We'll talk about those in chapter 10, I think it is. Uh, he was able to realize that these were like bullets and he could shoot these alpha particle bullets through matter and by looking at the way the bullets bounced off the matter maybe he could learn something about this plum pudding uh, electron combination mess that Thompson had proposed for the model of an atom. So he and his graduate students set up this experiment and they shot alpha particles at atoms and to their great surprise. He knew the alpha particle was way heavier than an electron and was going really fast. There's no way that an atom should be able to do very much to that alpha particle, maybe just bend it to the side a little bit. But every once in a while, they would see an alpha particle come straight back as if it had bounced off some really hard thing in the atom. Well, they knew the mass of the atom. And to make the thing that it bounced off be hard enough, that spot had to be really small. And so the only picture he could come up with that was consistent with his experiments was this solar system model that you see all over the place. It's uh, the symbol for the Atomic Energy Commission 
It's a terrible picture uh, because it's over 100 years old and it's wrong, but it looks cool. Another reason it's wrong is that that nucleus in the middle, that thing with the blue balls and the red balls in it, that's just way too big. Remember that it's 10 to the minus 5 times smaller than the atom itself. So if those big circles showing the electrons moving is the size of the atom, that nucleus thing should be 10 to the minus 5 smaller than that, which means on this in this picture it would be invisible, which is boring, so they make it too big. But um, there you go. That's artists for you. Well, so there's something seriously wrong with this model because the le those electrons are going around and around in a circle. And if you imagine looking at that electron, the one that's tipped at about 45 degrees from the upper left-hand corner to the lower right-hand corner, if you watch that electron going like this over and over and over again, I guess it, oh, well, yeah, so it's going like this over and over and over again. That's a wiggling electron. You know what wiggling electrons do. They radiate energy and you can calculate how much. And so um, people did that calculation and discovered that the atom, this atom couldn't exist for more than a few picoseconds. That's 10 to the minus 12 seconds because it would have radiated all the electron energy away. The electron would have spiraled into the nucleus combined with the protons and the atom would be gone. So this model had serious. Two years later, <clears throat> Niels Bohr, in an attempt to actually solve another problem having to do with atoms, which were which was the colors that came out when you uh, when you got them hot, you saw those colors through uh, your diffraction grading in class. We had all those different gases that we we. Uh, energized and you could see the light that came out and it wasn't a continuous smear of light. There were discrete colors that came out and Bohr was trying to understand the colors that came out of hydrogen gas. And he knew about Planck and Einstein and about the Planck constant, which had units of angular momentum. If an electron is orbiting an atom, well, that's it's spinning, it's going around a circle, so it has angular momentum. And he said, since angular momentum is quantized in, in light, let's see what happens if we guess that the angular momentum of the electron orbits in Rutherford's atom are quantized. So Bohr had them going in circles, but they couldn't go just in any old circle. They had to have had to be circles that had the right force on them, the electric attraction force between the nucleus and the electron. And that circular orbit, as it went around under the attractive force of the nucleus, it had to have an angular momentum of h bar, 2 h bar, 3 h bar, 4 h bar, just like, um, just like the quantum theory suggested that energy only came in, in chunks. He said, let's do that with angular momentum. And suppose the chunks are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 h bar. So he guessed that that was what, what was happening. And then once you do that, then there are discrete orbits that are allowed and everything else is not allowed. And so you have the n equal 1 orbit, which turns out to be one that's really pretty close to the nucleus. And then the n equal 2 orbit, which is further out, and the n equal 3 and 4 and 5 and 6. And then Bohr said, without explaining why, uh, these orbits are stable. <clears throat> he said, it's the weird quantum world. And once you have one of these integer multiples of the angular momentum, integer multiples of h bar, that sam somehow magically makes it be stable. He said, I don't understand that, but let's, let's pretend that that's true. Now let's see what we can do with this formula. Well, what you can do with that formula, Bohr proposed, is that you can have a model for how photons get emitted from an atom. Say an electron is in a large radius orbit, maybe the n equal four one over there on the left side of this picture. Maybe some it gets bumped somehow and that n equal four electron switches down to the n equal three orbit. It can't be something in between because the orbits are quantized. It can only go from four to three or three to two or two to one, four to two, something like that. Uh, so what would happen if you went from four to three? Or maybe from four to two, or three to two? 
Well, those are discrete energies because these orbits are spaced uh, apart in energy according to the formula. The minus 13.6 over n squared formula tells you what the energy of each orbit is. Bohr said the photon that comes out must have the energy, an energy equal to the difference of these two levels because when the electron dropped from high energy to low energy, the energy had to go somewhere and it must have gone in to this, to this photon. This theory perfectly predicts the hydrogen colors that you saw in class. Bohr nailed the colors. I'm going to let you do one of these. Go get a calculator out and find out what color of light comes from the transition from the n equal 3 state to the n equals 2 state, remembering that the energy of the nth state is minus 13.6 eV divided by n squared. So you'd be working with uh, 3 squared and 4 squared in this problem. So here I'm going to do it on my calculator. So I'll get the timing right. So I'll take 13.6 divided by <coughs> 2 squared, which is 4. <coughs> minus 13.6 divided by 9 and that gives me 1.89 eV. So now I know the energy of the photon that would be emitted in this process. I now use this handy dandy formula on the right which everybody who works with uh, atoms knows by heart. The wavelength in nanometers is equal to 1,240 divided by the energy in EV. So you take 1,240 divided by 1.89 and you get 656 nanometers and it's right there where that red line is. 650 and a little bit. It's right on. So everyone was really excited. These discrete colors that came out, somebody finally had an explanation for why they were at the colors they were. And Niels Bohr got the Nobel Prize for this, even though the theory was woefully inadequate. There was no discussion of how any of this radiation took place, uh, no clue about why these orbits were stable. But because it agreed with the experiment so well, he got a Nobel Prize, and he should have. He was a really bright guy. But there's a problem here. Every atom, as you saw in class when we had those different uh, different atomic gases, every atom has its own spectrum. And they're enormously complex. But Bohr only gives us one formula. That one formula works really well for the hydrogen atom, but it doesn't work for any other atoms. We need something better than Bohr's model of 1913. Well, enter Erwin Schrodinger. 1925. We talked about him last time. He wrote down his famous equation, and if you turn his equation into a wave, a standing wave equation, it looks like this. Looks pretty ugly, um, but Schrodinger was a really smart guy, and he figured out how to solve it for the hydrogen atom. And when he did, it predicted the same energy levels that Bohr's theory predicted, only this time it had some more detail that made it possible with some ex little bit of extra work, like putting, instead of just having the potential, that U of X thing you see in there, that's the potential energy between the nucleus and the electron. If you have like helium with two electrons, now you can also add to that potential the, the uh, repulsive potential energy between the two electrons. And that changes the equation and if you're really smart and have a computer, um, you can predict the helium spectrum from this same equation by putting in the electron repulsion. And vibrational uh, modes of complicated molecules and all kinds of stuff can be predicted by this thing. So in Schrodinger's picture, as we learned last time, uh, electrons are represented by their wave function, psi. And the electrons are distributed in probability in standing wave patterns around the nucleus. 
It's not like those for an electron in a box, but there are special patterns produced by solving this new equation um, with a nuclear potential instead of a particle in a box potential. Well, that's not easy. But Schrodinger was up to the job, and after some really spectacular mathematics, he found the standing wave patterns of the psi function of the electrons. And you have seen these standing wave patterns before. They're the fuzzy ball pictures of electron orbitals that you've seen in your chemistry class. Those are standing wave patterns of psi. They're called hydrogen electron orbitals. And they have uh, all these weird, crazy shapes that Schrodinger found, and they're very useful in describing what atoms look like. These, <clears throat> these um, fuzzy wave pictures have quantum numbers associated with them. If you remember the particle in the box last time, there were three quantum numbers, L, M, and N. L tells you how many wiggles there are in the x direction. M tells you how many wiggles there are in the y direction. And N tells you how many wiggles there are in the z direction. There are three of them. The reason there are three is because there's an x direction and a y direction and a z direction. That's the three-dimensional world we live in. So it turns out there are three quantum numbers. They tell you what the wave function looks like, namely how many wiggles it has. The atomic numbers that come out of Schrodinger's theory don't go with x, y, z. They go with another coordinate system, which I'll mention in a minute. But in that, his quantum numbers are n, which is called the principal quantum number. That's the same n that goes in Bohr's formula, where the energy levels of the hydrogen atom are minus 13.6 eV divided by n squared. Notice that the energy is negative. It should be. The electron is held in place by the nucleus, so it's down in a well. It's down in a hole, and you have to give it energy to have it get out. The second quantum number is L, script L. It's the total angular momentum number. Where N goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, L goes 0, 1, 2, 3, and it counts up to N minus 1. So it's a little tricky. For N equal 1, you can only have L equal 0 because it only goes up to N minus 1, which is 0. For N equal 2, you can have L equal 0 and 1. For n equal 3, you can have l equal 0, 1, and 2, etc. as you go up. And this is actually the backbone of the periodic table, and we're going to talk about that more uh, next time when we finish chapter 8. The third quantum number is called m, or m sub z, and it's a particular angular momentum component along some measurement axis that you pick. And the allowed values of m sub z depend on l. They go from minus l in integer steps up to L, including the zero in the middle. So for N equal one, you can have L equal zero, and you can only have MZ equal zero. For N equal two, you can have L equal zero, which means you could only have M equal zero. But if you have L equals one, going with N equal two, then the M can be minus one, zero, and one. In Schrodinger's theory, the energy levels do not depend on L and mz. They only depend on the principal quantum number n, which is good because that's the one that predicts what happens in the hydrogen atom. Now, if you know spherical coordinates, if you've had uh, calculus 3, I think is what you guys call it, uh, then you've had spherical coordinates, and that's the coordinate system that Schrodinger used. And so I can tell you, if you know spherical coordinates, what the, where the, how the wiggles work. N counts the number of wiggles in the radial direction, and L counts the number of wiggles in the theta direction. That's the polar angle that comes down from straight up and comes down. And MZ is the number of wiggles in phi. That's the angle that goes around the z-axis. Those are the three quantum numbers. There's three of them. There's three coordinates in spherical coordinates. So that's the three-dimensional world we live in again. In the particle in the box, there were three quantum numbers. And so in the atom, there are three quantum numbers. And they have physical meanings in this case that are, that are different than they were in the particle in the box. Uh, the n quantum number is for energy. 
The second quantum number, L, is for angular momentum, the magnitude of the angular momentum, which seems sort of odd because angular momentum is a vector and should have three components. But in quantum mechanics, all you get out of these states is the magnitude of the angular momentum and then the magnitude of the, the component of the angular momentum along one axis, the axis that you choose to measure it in. And that's all you get. You don't get three components of angular momentum. It's different from classical mechanics in that way. You can't know the other two components of the angular momentum in principle. Well, these standing wave patterns build a periodic table of the elements, as we'll see next time. But you need one more piece. The one more piece uh, is that electrons have spin. They have intrinsic angular momentum. An electron behaves like a little top which is crazy because as far as we know, the electron is a little tiny dot. It doesn't have any size at all, but it somehow has angular momentum, but it can only have two values. If you measure the angular momentum of, uh, angular momentum of an electron along some direction using a piece of equipment, maybe a magnetic field or something, uh, it, would, it might, point along that axis that you picked with angular momentum h bar over 2, or it might, might point opposite to that axis with angular momentum minus h bar over 2. Those are the only two values of its angular momentum it can have along an axis. It's quantized, but it's quantized funny. It's not quantized by h bar, but by h bar over 2. And that's kind of mysterious too, and we're not going to get into that. But it's called spin. And we say it can either be up or down, parallel to the axis we're measuring or opposite to it. Okay, well, as we'll see next time, <coughs> you can use these ideas to build the whole periodic table. Although it's not clear why the whole periodic table uh, could be represented in terms of the wave functions just of the hydrogen atom, because the other atoms don't look anything like hydrogen, but a little bit of a miracle happens and you can actually use the language of the hydrogen atom to describe the rest of the atoms in the periodic table and we'll get into that next time. One of the things that happens when you go up in the periodic, ta periodic table and it helps explain why the rows don't go in the perfect order that they should if we were talking about the hydrogen atom is that these wiggly orbitals tend to crowd the electrons together and that makes their potential energy go up and it changes changes the row of energy on in which uh, the atoms lie and that messes with the rows of, of the periodic table and we'll discuss that in more detail next time so if that makes no sense to you it's okay it's coming back okay now look there's something really crazy going on here I told you that electrons going up and down or side to side make uh, electromagnetic waves, and they do. If you, if you see some big tall radio antenna like this, that radio antenna has a big cable that goes from the bottom of the antenna clear up to the top, and the electronics in the broadcast station force electrons to go up and down and up and down. You have wiggling electrons going up and down and up and down. If KSL AM broadcast at 1160 kilohertz, that's 1.1 megahertz. Those electrons in that cable up the antenna are going up and down at 1.16 megahertz. And it makes radio waves. We know this. You wiggle charges, you get <coughs> electromagnetic waves. In your microwave oven, there's a thing that looks like this. It's called a gyrotron. In that gyrotron, electrons are made, an electron beam is formed and then it's made to wiggle and those wiggles are amplified and they make the microwaves that uh, heat your food up and we can see exactly how it works the electrons wiggle up and down and that makes waves up in the gigahertz range and that makes microwaves so when an electron drops from a high energy level in an atom to a lower energy level in the atom how does it wiggle so that it can emit a photon and the answer to that question is the big red question mark that you can see right there on the slide. We have no idea. Haven't got a clue. 
Just as we don't have a good mental picture of how a particle can simultaneously be a wave and a particle, we don't have a good way to visualize how an electron dropping from a high energy state to a low energy state emits a photon. But we have very good mathematics that predicts exactly what's observed in experiments. And quoting Sheryl Crow, it's not having what you want, it's wanting what you've got. And what we've got is a very good mathematical theory that predicts exactly what happens in experiments. And I guess for now, we're just gonna to have to be satisfied with that. So here's one last quiz question for you that we'll lead into next time. Why don't the electrons all just sit in the lowest quantum state, the ground state, the hydrogen-like ground state for every atom, so that every atom looks like hydrogen? All the electrons are in the same state, and then you wouldn't have any chemistry. Everything would look like hydrogen, and the world would be boring. So why doesn't this happen? And you may remember the answer is the electrons are antisocial fermions. Fermions is that word you can't quite see because I covered it up. And we will talk about fermions and bosons in more detail later. And in particular, we'll talk about the fermion behavior of electrons and the periodic, periodic table next time. Okay, you have some questions you can think about for next time. And I will see you in a couple of days.